has arrived at Ustila, and there are several chapters which are, of course, it's hard to know exactly how historically accurate these are, um, but having heard how deeply Menasha Unger was steeped in Hasidic tradition, I consider this an important historic ethnographic source on what a uh, we call a royal Hasidic wedding in the early 19th century would have been like. This chapter is called The Groom Holds Court Before the Ceremony. And I picked it partly because, especially in the first page, it's one of the uh, few places in this book where we get nice, solid information about what the women were doing all the time. The town of Ostila was topsy-turvy from early in the morning on Friday, the day before the wedding ceremony. Rural Jews came to town with their wives and children, as if for the start of Yantif. Most of the village folk brought along wagons full of harvest goods as wedding presents, and some of them brought ducks, geese, and young calves for the nightly ritual meal and special blessings throughout the week following the wedding. The village Jews looked curiously at the Hasidic Cossacks. I, I, have, to, I have to explain that one. Um, <laughs> Part of this celebration was Hasidic men dressed up as Cossacks to formally, to perform a formal retinue for their rebbes. Loud voices could be heard in all of the inns where the various rebbes were staying, but the loudest noise came from the house of the rebbe of Ostila himself. The Ostila Rebetzin, the bride's mother, hurried from room to room in outrage that the wedding dress wasn't yet finished and the seamstresses hadn't completed the entire costume. For more than a week already, the three seamstresses and female tailors had been sitting in the Rebbitsons' room doing nothing but sewing their wedding clothes. And when the seamstress did finally bring in the white silk wedding dress, a large number of female in-laws and Hasidic women were together with the bride in her room. They immediately sent for the two elderly grandmothers, the Neshizer Rebetzin and the Akta Rebetzin, who arrived in the same coach accompanied by a pair of Cossacks. The wedding musicians came, and the elderly Neshizer Rebetzin took out a couple of old, worn-out silver coins that she had inherited from the old Mezrish Rebbe, placed them into the stuffing of the groom and bride's bed, and murmured various prayers as she did so. Only then did the, the elderly Hasidic women make the last stitches in the cover. For her part, the elderly Octa Rebetzin took the silken wedding dress, secretly murmured a spell, and sewed into the front of the dress an amulet which had come down to her from the Baal Shem Tov. They had a poor girl of marriageable age from town put the dress on, as was the custom, and only then did they dress the 13-year-old bride in her wedding dress. Then all of the female in-laws and Hasidic women led the bride to the women's study house where she sat until the ceremony. While the bride sat in the women's study house and the town girls performed various dances, the 14-year-old groom sat in his quarters at the inn holding court. The largest crowd was assembled at the groom's door. The Hasidim of Ratzibil Abdel Neshlis all wanted to convey their petitions to the groom before the wedding. The emaciated young groom didn't even know how to respond properly to such petitions, but nevertheless, Hasidim reported that he knows how to read a petition. The five chis of Hasidim made their way into the groom's room to confirm with their own eyes that the 14-year-old really had the nerve to take petitions. The Pshishka saw the young groom taking the petitions in his hand, just like a Rebbe. At his side stood Laser Lay, the old Upter's secretary, who was in charge of the proceedings and who indicated which of the women the groom should see first. Then Laser Lay quickly pushed each one away, shouting, Let somebody else in, there's no time. But one woman was stubborn and didn't want to back away. She stood in front of the young groom and wept in a high-pitched voice, relating that just one week after her wedding, her husband had left her. For ten years now, she had been a grass widow and childless. But the groom didn't hear a word the woman was shouting at him and asked, Pregnant? Nursing? Don't you hear me, holy bridegroom? I'm a grass widow without a child! Yes, okay. But... Pregnant? Nursing? It was the same 
question he often heard from his grandfather when a woman was in an audience with the latter. The woman didn't understand what the room meant, and she remained standing with her mouth open, as though her capacity to speak had suddenly vanished. But at that point, the secretary of Laser Lake got involved. He murmured something into the groom's ear. The groom blushed somewhat, lowered his eyes in embarrassment, and right away offered his blessing. Go in good health, and you will be helped. And I'm just going to skip a bit and read the scene where the five Shisla Hasidim get to meet the old Akhtar Rav, <coughs> Rav Avin Yeshua Hashem. They walked through the marketplace, which was full of Hasidim, and Rav Vival agrees in turn to Rav Zishev Shekatzer. Is it any surprise that they persecute us? They brought Hasidic Hasidism down to such a low level. They do business in wonders, magic healing, and ambulance, just like a goyish folk healer. It will make our task at the trial that much harder, Rebzishus said with sigh. But convey the petitions of the old Akhtar Rebbe before the wedding ceremony is still something we have to do. One thing has nothing to do with the other. <clears throat> to attend the Akhtar Rebbe is a great thing now. The whole house was besieged by gangs of Hasidim who pushed in through the doors and windows, trying by every means to make their way into the Akhtar Rebbe's room. In every room, scribes of sacred scrolls as well as simple petition writers sat at long tables writing out petitions with goose quill pens. At this busy time, the petition writers didn't want to write out the detailed petitions that the Hasidim were used to hand again. Keep it short, they'd say. You can tell it all to the Rebbe when you see him. Uh, just tell me the name of this cruel nobleman and his mother's name. What's that? Jan Bronislav Ben Kasha Maria? I've got it down. Go in and may you be helped. The five chiefs of the Hasidim pushed toward the Rebbe's door. Laser Lady, the chief secretary, rubbed his fingers together to indicate to them that they had to pay. When Rebbe Yusufel Horowitz handed the secretary a promissory note for a large sum, the secretaries pushed the rest of the crowd aside, and the five chiefs of the Hasidim were admitted to see the Rebbe. The old doctor, sat in his child's clothes on an upholstered chair, smoking a large pipe. Two candles burned on the table next to a glass of water. Before reading each petition, the actor dipped his fingers into the glass, rubbed his forehead, and quietly murmured something. When Rev. Ichamero laid his petition on the table, the old actor took it in his hand and turned it from side to side. What kind of petition is this? the doctor asked. It's entirely empty. Only by the light of the candle did the Rebbe see the words that were written there. Yitzchok Meir ben Chayasara, for fear of heaven and spiritual healing. The doctor read the petition a few times and then said in astonishment,